Okay, so it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Amal uh, Hussein, who's a graduate student at uh, Imperial, and then we'll be giving a lecture series on dynamics of games and uh, multi-agent uh, learning. Yeah, thank you, Amal. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Boumediene said, there's two parts to this title. Uh, that this is a title that'll be part of a series of talks uh, in, instead of just, just the one where we're gonna be looking at various aspects of dynamics of games and multi-agent learning. Okay, so to begin with, I want to first kind of take the two separate elements and, and focus a little bit more on the multi-agent learning stuff and put, put the dynamics of games to one side for, 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 for the moment. And the reason that I wanna do that is because I think this second part, this multi-agent learning part, kind of encapsulates the central question of, of the entire series of talks in this general field of research, which is how do multiple entities interact, react and adapt to one another? And when I use the word entities, I, I genuinely mean any possible entity you can think of. I mean, how do particles interact with one another, right? How does one company react to the behavior of another company? Or how does a population of rabbits interact with a population of foxes, right? So any sort of entity that you can think of, we wanna understand the, the collaboration or their co-adaptation, right? And so you can take this multi-agent learning side of things and replace it with whatever word you want. You could call it collective adaptation. You could call it co-evolution. Honestly, any, any phrase that answers the exact same question. And in fact, you will come across each of these terms in the literature because these sorts of topics that we're gonna be visiting come from areas in population biology. They come from, of course, game theory, which is what we're gonna be looking at. Uh, they come from statistical physics. Lots of different areas look at this particular issue, which in essence just revolves around collective adaptation, right? And, and the interaction of, of multiple uh, entities. Now, specifically, we're going to be trying to answer this question or get our heads around it from the point of view of game theory. Um, I'm not sure what the background of everyone is uh, in terms of, of game theory and how much everyone wants to hear about it. So this is the way that it's kind of going to go. I've uh, got here a kind of, let's say, five minute crash course on game theory and the central concepts that we're gonna be needing later. But what we've also got is an accompanying set of notes, uh, just some a, a compilation of the literature that you might wanna look at if you're quite interested in looking at the, you know, the, the technical details, the proofs, the derivations, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, and of course it goes into much more, more of the mathematical foundations of game theory. Uh, what that means for this talk is that I'm gonna keep things quite heuristic. I'm gonna keep things quite high level uh, so that there's not gonna be a lot of you know, rigorous theorem proving and you can find that in, in the notes if you are interested. Um, that's gonna be the same for the dynamical aspects of what we're dealing with. I'm gonna keep things quite heuristic here and then if you wanna have a look. Of course, the notes aren't the only resource that you can come across. You can uh, find equivalent if not better explanations uh, in, in various texts and references are provided as well. Um, okay, so uh, with that caveat out of the way, let me just introduce game theory. So the way that I like to think about it is that game theory just gives us a framework by which we can conduct thought experiments, right? So Einstein had his clocks and rulers, we have game theory to, to think about our problems. Um, and the way that I usually introduce it is by considering, you know, actual games that we can think of, things like chess, um, or uh, you can replace it with whatever you want. You could replace it with Go, or you could replace it with um, Pong, whatever takes your fancy. But let's let's use the example of chess, right? In chess, what do you have? Firstly, you have a set of agents, right? And this is usually, a, you know, a, a discrete set of multiple. Uh, multiple points. You don't really have one point because there would be no point playing chess just against yourself. So we can call that the set of agents. Then you have a set of actions um, and I'm gonna denote that as S. 
And those of you who know game theory and have not yet nodded off will notice that I'm using just one set for uh, the strategy space of all of the agents. Now, there's no reason why agents can't have different actions available to them that just for the sake of simplicity, I'm focusing on, on the case where you just have one set of actions. Okay, so in the context of chess, this would be things like, you know, you can move the pawn in a certain way, you can capture in a certain way, you can castle your king, what, what, what the, um, your problem requires. And now we need to think about, okay, how do the agents actually choose between their actions, right? What makes one better than the other? And to codify this in some sense, we use a payoff function. And in this case, I actually am gonna um, denote it with respect to particular agents, right? And the payoff function basically says, okay, this is how I'm going to make my decision. So if we take, for example, what can we use? Okay, take for example, me deciding whether I want to come into the office today or not, right? When I make that decision, I'm going to think, okay, who is likely to be in the office today? Are there going to be a lot of people, in which case it might get quite noisy, I might not get a lot of work done. Is it going to be quite quiet? The people who are there, do I, do I even like the people who are there? Am I actually going to have fun? Uh, or am I you know, going to get bored and want to go home eventually? And so my decision in that sense is dependent not only on what I want to do, i.e. the work that I want to get done, but also what the other agents or people in the office want to do, i.e. they want to get their work done or they want to have fun or, or whatever the case may be. So the reason why I'm saying that is because I want to make the point that this payoff function is going to be acting on the set of everyone's actions, which is why you have the, the power of n there. Um, and it's going to be scalar valued, right? Um, and so once you have all of these three things, you have a set of agents, you have what they can do and the payer function, which kind of encodes why they do it, uh, you can define the game. So you can find game gamma as just this tuple that contains everything that we have so far. Right? So if we take a, a slightly different example of, let's say I'm trying to, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to decide when to go into work this time. Uh, this is something that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with, although not from working from home for the last, last year or so. But let's say I wanna commute into work, right? I know that I could, I could go in at maybe seven, I could go in at eight, I could go in at nine, right? But I know that most people will also be going in at eight. That's, that's why it's called rush hour, right? So if I wanna minimize the amount of time that I take to go to work, I should probably not go at eight because that's when other people will be doing it. Rather, I should go in at around seven, right? I probably shouldn't leave at nine because I'll be late for work. But um, the, the point is that my decision is dependent on other people's actions as well as what I want. And all of this is gonna be scalar valued in here, right? In this case, I wanted to, to minimize the, the travel time. So does that make sense so far? I hope it does. Um, the, the things that I think should be uh, quite intuitive at this point is obviously the set of agents and the set of actions that they can take. What I've kind of glossed over a little bit is the form that this, this payoff function can take. Uh, and so I, I want to go into that at the moment. Uh, and specifically, I'm gonna be looking at uh, a type of game called a matrix game, where the payoff function is entirely encoded by the action of, of matrices. But there's no reason why it has to be through matrices or it has to be linear in, in, in any sense. You can actually take your payoff function as say a convex cost function, which obviously appears quite a lot in control contexts. Uh, or you can, you know, you could uh, throw in any payoff function you want, depending on, on what situation you're dealing with. Okay. So that's essentially what a game is. We've what we've done is we've taken something that we intuitively somewhat understand and put it into a rigorous format. Let's take a couple of examples just to make this absolutely clear. By the way, if at any point you guys have a question based on uh, you know something that you've seen, maybe a clarification point, then please feel free to interrupt me. 
um, and I will I will clarify whatever the issue is. I'll also stop at particular points to ask if anyone has any further questions where we can discuss it a little bit. But uh, other than that, just feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so the example that I wanna look at is what's called the prisoner's dilemma, okay? The reason why is twofold. One, I think it's actually quite a good example. And the second reason is because this is the typical example that's given in game theory. In fact, anyone here who studied it will have seen the prisoner's dilemma before, but it's kind of, it's almost blasphemous if I would start talking about game theory and not mention the prisoner's dilemma. So I'm gonna do it. Um, in this particular example, we have two criminals, right? Uh, or two agents. And let's just call them Alex and Bob, just to keep names for name's sake, right? And basically the idea is that they, they've been arrested in connection for some kind of crime. And the judge uh, gives them uh, uh, the following offer, right? The agents have the option to either confess to said crime or to deny it, right? And the, the offer is that if both of them confess to the crime, then they get a reduced sentence of five years in prison. If one of them decides to confess and the other decides to deny, then the one who confessed walks off free, whilst the other one gets 20 years in prison. And this is, of course, symmetric the other way around as well. Um, and if both of them deny, then they both get uh, a year in prison and that's it, right? So the way that we'd like to do this is, okay, so we've, we've got a set of agents, we've got a set of actions. Uh, let's think about what the payoffs looks, look like. And what I wanna do is I wanna separate out the payoff functions into U, which we'll associate to Alex and V that we're gonna associate to Bob, right? And all of these payoffs are, as you've seen, encoded in this table here, right? What I'd next like to do is kind of separate out this table into two separate matrices uh, in which I'm gonna write all the payoffs for, uh, what did we call them, Alex, uh, in, in this first matrix A, right? So in this case, it would be five. And in fact, let's call it minus five, just because it's a cost. Then zero, then minus 20, then minus one, right? And you can do the exact same thing for, well, uh, this would be zero, this would be minus one, right? So the, the reason why I'm doing this is because in this particular example, this means that you can take this payoff function u, you can take the payoff function v, and you can represent it entirely with a uh, the matrix A and the matrix B respectively, right? And so the whole idea of game theory is to ask the question, okay, what is gonna be a reasonable outcome for this game, right, for this, particular interaction. And you can go through an entire process of, you know, assuming that the agents are completely rational and they have complete knowledge of, of this matrix game, but what you'll end up finding, and again, this is in the notes if you, you wanna see how this is derived, but what you'll end up finding is that game theory predicts that this box here, where both agents confess, is the most likely outcome. In fact, it's what's called a Nash equilibrium. And Obviously, those of you who study game theory will know what this is, but also anyone who may have watched the film A Beautiful Mind will also have come across this concept. If you haven't seen the film, you should definitely see the film. It's a really, really, really good one. Um, so this is the idea of Nash equilibrium, which essentially says that rational agents will, will play this particular strategy and they'll stick to this strategy, right? Um, and what we wanna do from a dynamics of games perspective, well, one of the questions is, is that a reasonable statement to make? Uh, will they actually reach the Nash equilibrium or will they do something completely different, right? Um, so we'll look into that. But before we do, I wanna do one more example, which is the rock, paper, scissors example, right? We've all played rock, paper, scissors. Uh, the idea is you again have a set of agents. You know what, let's say it's me versus you, right? And our set of strategies are of course rock, paper and scissors, and you'll see how horrible my notation is because S denotes both scissors and the set of actions, but I'm sure you get the idea, okay? So what we wanna do is define a similar payoff matrix um, uh, for, for both me and for you in, in this manner. And so what we'll do first is just 
quickly write out a table, right? So let's say these are all of your strategies, these are all of mine. I have rock, paper, scissors, you have rock, paper, scissors. And so if we draw, then let's just call that a payoff of zero along the diagonals. And if I win, let's call that a payoff of one. And if I lose, a payoff of minus one, right? And you can fill out the entire matrix or table, whatever you want to call it, in a similar manner. Um, and you know this this would keep going on. Let's just fill it out for completeness sake, right? So now that we've established this, again, you want to split it up into A and B, and and the way that you would do that is just you know take the first element exactly the same way that we did for the prisoner's dilemma. You just take the first uh, the the corresponding element for A and B. The reason why I'm bringing these examples into the picture, by the way is because they're actually going to play uh, an influence in the particular dynamic that we talk about today. Um, we're gonna see that both the prisoner's dilemma, or at least a variant of it, and the rock, paper, scissors game, again, a variant of it, uh, is actually going to lead to some quite complex dynamics, right? And that's, well, that's what we're all here to hear about. So we, we've got the, the two matrices defined. And the, the thing that I want to do, that I want to extend from the prisoner's dilemma is I want to actually allow agents to randomize their strategies, right? I'm just going to write this up here. Um, and the reason for doing that is because we no longer just want to think about what strategy is played, but rather with what probability they are played. Um, and this kind of is codified in what is called the mixed strategy. So let's say I play with some probability P, right? which is my probability of playing rock, paper, and scissors, right? Let's call that P1, P2, P3. And similarly, you play with Q1, Q2, and Q3, right? In, in exactly a symmetric way. Um, the whole point of game theory at this point is to say, well, what are the values of P and Q going to be for the particular game defined by A and B? Right? That is our central question in this entire endeavor. Yeah. The particular type of game that I'm talking about is what's called a bimatrix game. This, I think you can intuitively understand why it's called a bimatrix game. There's just, you know, there's two players, all of their payoffs are represented by the action of matrices, hence bimatrix game. Okay. And as I said, the the whole purpose that we're we're undertaking here is to figure out what the value of this tuple PQ is going to be at the end of play. Does that make sense? Um, are there any questions based on what we've done so far? Because that was the high level introduction to game theory. Anything so far? No, okay. Um, so we've done game theory and we need to start to think is about- a short where... question here. Yes. Is the diagonal must be the same for both players? Not necessarily. Um, so there are particular types of games. In fact, this is uh, a type of game called a zero sum game in which basically if you look at the payoffs or the values in each of the components and you add the corresponding values, they always add up to zero. Right, so it's a very particular type of game. As to the diagonals themselves, there's no reason why they necessarily have to be the, the same for both agents. You can vary as much as you want, right? So uh, I guess in the examples that I gave, yeah, you, you, you notice that quite well, that in both examples, the diagonals are the same, but um, I'm gonna have to ask you to take my word for the fact that they don't always have to be, okay? What about the symmetry? Uh, again, the, they don't um, they don't necessarily have to be symmetric in in any sense. You can put whatever you want as your your payoff matrix. These are just two particular examples of of those. Um, I think in the the corresponding notes, we do have a couple of examples where the payoff matrices are, are completely different. Um, and actually, I should mention that uh, I, I think I said this earlier, but I've defined all of these through the action of matrices. But just on your point. 
they don't necessarily need to take any particular form and neither do they actually need to be defined through the action of matrices. Uh, you can have whatever you want as your, your payout function, right? It really just depends on the context of the problem that you're looking at. So if I have uh, multi-agents, like huge number, mm. can I expect these matrices to be sparse or I have to sparsify them? So ideally they would be sparse, um, but I'm just speaking from personal experience here that typically they aren't. Uh, you would have to, um, I guess, make some reductions to them to, to get them into a sparse format. Um, but yeah, again, you could, you could honestly have even a population system, you could have the payoffs defined in any given way. And in fact, we're, we're going to talk about populations uh, slightly later, but just to um, give a bit of a spoiler, you can even define these sorts of matrices, not necessarily just across every single agent, but you might have a particular case where, for example, uh, where should I draw this? Let's draw this here. Um, you have one agent and it's interacting, let's say on a network with a bunch of other neighbors, right? What you could have is uh, perhaps the payoff function for this, this agent is going to be some convex combination of payoffs along you know, each one of these edges, right? So you can honestly define your, your payoffs in generically any way that you want, want the situation to be handled. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions at this point? No? Okay. Um, okay, so the point that we want to enter now is, yeah, so where, where does learning come in? And this is where we're going to start introducing the idea of, of dynamics. The reason why is if we take, let's take the commuting into work example, right? When I'm deciding that I, I need to commute to work, how am I doing it? I, I wasn't born as a baby with some inherent knowledge of when rush hour is, right? Instead, what I did is I, I went to work, I uh, I, I went to school and I, I saw that at a particular time, let's say at, uh, around eight o'clock, between eight and nine, a lot of people are driving their kids to school. They're, they're all going to work and it's always really busy. So I probably shouldn't leave then, right? And then I, I adjust that to maybe, okay, I'm going to start leaving at nine, but then I get to work late or, or the, uh, yeah, how, however it ends up being. The reason that why I bring that up is because it kind of, brings about this intuition that we don't necessarily just rationalize all of our behavior, right? Instead, we kind of think about what we've done in the past, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, and we adjust our behavior accordingly. And that's the whole thesis of learning. That's what the whole framework is built around. Now, when you deal with multiple agents, now we're dealing with a case that, um, you know, I have to react to your behavior and see, you know, how you respond to what I do, you're gonna do the exact same thing. You're gonna think about how you, how I'm gonna to respond to what you do and we're gonna keep adapting to one another, right? Like basing our behavior off our, our learned experience, yeah? And you can see that this is, this is a fundamentally non-stationary problem, right? You no, you no longer have this idea of, for example, in the Nash equilibrium where agents are just gonna play one action and they're just going to stick to it. Rather, we're going to keep adapting to each other's behavior. Now, I do have um, a video that was supposed to help describe this, but I've been told that it plays audio on top of me speaking. And I'm sure you guys would rather hear my voice than anything else, right? So I'm not going to play it this time. Uh, but the, the idea is that these, this company, OpenAI, I'm sure you've heard of them, they trained these agents to play the game of hide and seek, right? So they have a group of seekers, a group of hiders, and through multiple rounds of play, the agents learned some really, really interesting behavior. They were able to do things like block uh, doors in, in, in the room so that they could hide in a room without the seekers ever coming in. Then after a slightly longer period of time, the seekers learned that they could actually just, you know, kind of jump over the wall of, of this room and find the hiders anyway. And the point of this is to say that none of this was just in necessarily encoded into 
the agents from, from the start of play. Rather, they learned, they adapted, they built some experience, and they figured out what the best actions to play were. I'm not going to play this now, but if you just type in OpenAI hide and seek, you should come across the, the video. And I, I think you should, because I think it's quite a, an interesting explanation or even an example of where, from a design perspective, learning comes in, right? Uh, so the point of that was to say that learning is quite a, a dynamic process. And I obviously use that term quite um, intentionally, because if our question is, what is the ultimate behavior of learning going to be? Well, dynamical systems is basically built to answer the question, right? I have a dynamic process. What is the asymptotic behavior of this dynamic process going to be? And this is where dynamics enters the picture of game theory, yeah? So for that, what we need is a model for, for learning or adaptation. And the specific ones that we're going to consider are the replicator dynamic. I think if um, any of you saw Sebastian's lecture, uh, I think it was a few months ago, you will be aware of each of these uh, learning models, but let me just quickly review them now. Uh, so the first is the replicator dynamic, which has pretty strong links to evolutionary game theory and also convex optimization, right? This is a much more recent result to connect it to convex optimization, but uh, it's, I think it's quite interesting from a, a computational side. And then fictitious play, uh, again, this one probably has the longest history in terms of game theory itself. I think it was proposed in, I wanna say the 1950s or the 1960s. Uh, so around about the same time as uh, the Nash equilibrium itself. Um, so fictitious play is, is has a, quite a rich history from economics, but also in terms of control. It's used a lot in control contexts. And finally, Q learning. If uh, anyone in the audience here has studied reinforcement learning, they've probably come across Q learning. It's used a lot in, uh, I guess you would say, AI context, reinforcement learning. Okay. So the reason why I want to uh, use these particular learning models, they are not the only learning models that exist in the world, of course. Um, but the reasons why I want to do them are threefold. One, there's only so much time in our lives. So we can only focus in on a few of them. And these are the ones that I've gone with. Number two is because as I said, they're used, I think of the algorithms that I've seen, these are the most uh, prominently used in computational uh, environments, which I'm sure as machine learning researchers, you would find more interesting. And also because uh, on a slightly more biased sense, these are the ones that I look at. So I'm a little bit more familiar with with the algorithms themselves. So and that said, I want to kind of put these two away for the moment and just focus on, on the replicator dynamic itself, right? And we'll get on to fictitious playing Q learning so slightly if later. I, if I have to adjust to other players, do I have to know a priori who is more important and I have to adjust more to them than to others? So you're talking in some sense, like an idea of prioritization of who you listen to more and who you don't, is that right? Yeah, I'm expecting the answer to deal with weights in a graph mm. or in a network. Yeah, um, in fact, this is actually an area that's quite recent, the idea of what are called network games, in which as, uh, the, the model I think that you're talking about is where you have you know multiple Agents, let's say, I don't know, this this colored in agent over here is the head of a company, right? P the people that follow this node are going to be more biased towards its own opinion than, than anybody else's, right? And you're absolutely right. This would uh, be encoded within weights on a graph. Now that's a particular model and it is quite an interesting model, but it's not the only one. So it, it's a little bit more complicated than the ones that we're looking at here, which is just a two by two or, or, or two player game where there's no sense of who's more important than the other. Once you add more agents into the environment, then you need to start thinking about things like, you know, weights and, and, and biases and that kind of thing. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so where were we? Yeah, so the, we're going to focus on the replicated dynamic um, in this particular talk, and we can get on to the other learning models slightly later. Okay. So as I said, replicated dynamic has quite a strong history in evolutionary game theory. And the reason why is because it encodes this notion of survival of the fittest, right? Um, which is, I guess, the central concept in, in evolutionary theory, right? And the way that we would think about it is, okay, let's say uh, in, in a game theoretic sense, I have a probability vector, right? So this would be the probability by which I apply action one all the way down to action n, right? And I'm sure you know that since it's a probability vector, I have to have that the, the sum equals one, right? Um, so the idea of the replicated dynamic is to say the actions that do well should be promoted and should be more likely to thrive, I guess. Uh, and the actions that don't do so well should diminish over time, right? In a similar way, if you take a population, the quote unquote fitter part of the population, the ones that are better adapted to the environment should be more likely to survive and propagate. The ones who don't do so well are more likely to uh, diminish and even go extinct, right? So how do we put this down into a format? Well, we write it in terms of an ODE, right? So let's take the time derivative of my action I. And what I'm gonna say is, okay, I wanna encode this survival of the fittest notion, right? So what I'm gonna do is I wanna look at the reward that I get for playing action I with some probability, uh, with my probability vector X, right? If that's high, then essentially X I dot should be positive because well, it's, it's doing well. And so to normalize it and to make that condition clear, we compare the reward of playing action I with the average reward across all actions. So this is the expected reward I get for playing action I, and this would be the average reward across all of my, let's go average, reward for all of my actions, right? So you can see that if the reward for playing action I is higher than the average, then of course this term is greater than zero, which means X I dot increases and vice versa if the reward is lower than the average reward, right? And finally, what I want to do is just include this proportional term, which um, I think is somewhat intuitive, but in some sense, it encodes this idea of stubbornness that if I have, you know, if I already play something with a high probability, then I'd like to play it with a higher probability as well. From population context, what this would look like is if there's a lot of one particular species or phenotype in the uh, population, then the uh, rate at which they propagate would, would be higher, right? There's usual population dynamics. And then this whole thing just defines the replicated dynamic, which I just write as, as RD. And this is my whole concept of adaptation in this, uh, in this problem. Um, so my question from a dynamical perspective is, okay, what's the behavior going to be if my agents adapt according to the replicated dynamic? Are the economists right in saying that eventually we're gonna reach this Nash equilibrium, this fixed point where everyone's behaving completely rationally, or are we gonna do something quite different, right? Because if you think about it, the, the Nash equilibrium is this fixed strategy, which from a dynamical perspective is just a fixed point, right? It's an equilibrium point. And from uh, the whole concept of nonlinear dynamics, a fixed point is the o isn't the only behavior that can occur. You can have a lot of different types of, um, of dynamic, a, a lot of different, like a huge variety of behaviors. And the fixed point in some sense, I don't, obviously all behaviors are interesting, but in some sense, the fixed point is the most boring of the lot, right? Because you can get other behaviors, for example, uh, do the agent cycle around? So they prefer one action at, uh, really highly at one time and then a different action really highly at another time and so on and so forth, right? So in a dynamical sense, do they reach a limit cycle or uh, behave according to a center? Whatever the case may be, or do they do something even more interesting? Do they um, 
change their behavior in a chaotic manner, right? From a dynamical perspective, we know that even simple systems can achieve uh, chaotic dynamics. When you're looking at billiard balls or, or coupled pendulums, if they can do it, there's really no reason why collective adaptation shouldn't be able to, to achieve similar behaviors, right? So these are the sorts of questions that we wanna ask of, um, of our model. Now, I had a small segment here on the space on which I plot all of these behaviors, because remember, our, our question is, what is the ultimate behavior of this probability vector x? And so in order to, to see that, we need to plot it on what's called the simplex. Um, but I think that everyone in the, the audience, it, I think, is most likely aware of what the simplex is. So I'm gonna give it an even, even shorter introduction and just say that it's the space on which probability vectors live. So if I have a two-dimensional probability vector, which of course you have to have that x1 plus x2 has to equal one, then you have kind of constrained your whole possible space of probability vectors into uh, in two dimensions, it would just be a line, right? So for example, in this case, I can have 0 0.4, 0 0.6 as a probability vector, but I can't have 0 0.2, 0 0.2, right? Um, fairly, fairly intuitive stuff. And in three dimensions, this actually looks like a triangle, right? Uh, and you can show that it looks like a triangle. In fact, if you've studied uh, convex optimization or, or any notion of convexity, this kind of makes sense because basically the simplex just becomes a convex combination of uh, of various points, right? And of course that results in a, in a triangle. Um, just to, are there any questions on the simplex itself? Would you like me to go over it a little bit more slowly or is everyone comfortable with the idea? Based on the response, I'm going to say it's okay to move on. I hope it is. So the reason why I'm introducing the simplex, as I said, is because it's the space on which I have to plot all of these behaviors. So I didn't want to give you these plots and not actually explain what the, the plots are on. So in this particular example, uh, I'm plotting the trajectories of replicator on this game called the iterated prisoner's dilemma. As you can imagine, this is just a variation of the normal prisoner's dilemma in which shock and horror, the agents iterate the game, right? Uh, and the idea is you, you take the same set of agents, I can't remember what I call them, let's just call them A and B, um, and they have this time a slightly different strategy set. The first action that they can take is to what's called always cooperate. And what this means is they're going to cooperate with one another, which means they're gonna deny, um, yeah, they're, they're gonna deny committing the crime, right? Or deny the charges. The other is always defect, which in some sense is the idea that agents will always betray one another. Uh, in the prisoner's dilemma context, this means uh, they, they'll always confess to the crime, right? So they're gonna ignore what's in the best social interest and just deny to the crime um, or deny the charges, sorry. And then finally, they can also engage in what's called tit for tat which is this notion that, okay, I'm gonna, assume, I'm gonna cooperate with you completely until I see that you betray me. So if in the last time step you cooperated with me, I will do so as well. If you betrayed me in the last time step, I'm gonna betray you as well. So it's, it's really a strong sense of, I guess, uh, benefit of the doubt followed by a really harsh punishment for, um, moving off that strategy, right? And this was studied, uh, I think, by the economist. I think he was an economist, uh, Axelrod, where he uh, asked agent, or, or he, he asked a number of professors to submit solutions to this iterated prisons dilemma game. And the one that ended up uh, winning out was this tip to strategy, which is quite interesting from an ec economic perspective. The reason why it's interesting from an ec economic perspective is because this always defects strategy where agents are always going to uh, betray one another and confess to the crime is what game theory predicts will happen, 
right? This, this was the Nash equilibrium, if you remember from our previous discussion. And so when tit for tat was the, the one that gave the highest payoff in the end, it was a, a little bit surprising. And so our question in this context is, will replicator, uh, if it, my agents adapt according to the replicator dynamic, what will they do, right? And so I've plotted out the trajectories for replicator and you can see that they actually end up converging as you'd necessarily expect to this always defect strategy, right? So you could say in, in some way that, yep, we had the right idea. The agents are gonna play the Nash equilibrium, right? But is this always gonna be the case? What I'd like to show you now is the answer is no. And specifically what I'd like to do is introduce, well, not really introduce, just talk about a slight variant of the replicator equation, which is called the replicator mutator equation, right? And what the replicator mutator equation says is, I'm gonna throw in a little bit of stochasticity into the problem so that, you know, uh, not only do we have this whole survival of the fittest thing where good actions are promoted, but the actions are, are diminished, but also I'm not a rational human being. I like to mix things up from time to time. I like to do the wrong action with a high probability from time to time, um, just because, well, I'm a human being, right? And so the mutation component of it says, okay, I there's a probability by which one of my actions can actually mutate into another one, right? So it, it just throws in a little bit of randomness into the problem. Um, and so over here, I've written how much randomness there is. So this uh, U here denotes the probability of this mutation. And you can see it's quite small, but it leads to quite qualitatively different behavior, where instead of moving to this always defect strategy that was in this bottom right hand corner, Actually, agents, well, some of them, uh, depending on the initial conditions, will reach there, but a lot of other initial conditions will actually end up in the agent cycling between the always cooperate, always defect, and tip attack strategy. Right? And that's just by throwing in the smallest amount of randomness into the problem, you no longer have this guarantee of equilibration. Yeah? And if you throw in a little bit more randomness, you get the exact same sort of behavior with a slightly more concentrated um, limit cycle. But the, the point remains that you're not actually gonna equilibrate, right? And so this assumption that we can say that our agents are always gonna play to the Nash equilibrium clearly turns out to be false, depending on how they, they adapt, right? I should mention that the references for each of these studies, so these experiments that I've done, um, are, I produce myself, but the, uh, works on which they're based, the references are all in the notes. So if you do want to check out the original papers, uh, you can check them out there, right? Um, okay, so that, that was one possible behavior, these, these limit cycles behavior. What I wanna say next is that we can actually take this cyclic idea slightly further with the following example. This is the matching pennies example, and again, yeah, again, we're gonna have this situation where um, the payoffs are symmetric. Again, uh, um, I, I, I realize that's a bit annoying, but I am gonna have to ask that you take my word for the fact that they don't always have to be symmetric, okay? Um, so the matching pennies game essentially is, okay, let's say it's me versus you again, right? And we have two options. We either, well, I guess we flip a coin uh, in secret and we say that, you know, our strategies are either gonna be heads or tails for both of us, right? And essentially once we reveal the answer, in fact, for anyone who knows the game, it's quite similar to the game odds on, where if the number that you choose matches, then one person wins. If they mismatch, then the other person wins. If you don't know the odds on game, then don't worry about it. Um, but the matching pennies specifically says that if you have, myself against you, if we match the pennies, then let's say I win. So I get one, you get minus one, right? But if instead we mismatch, then you win and I lose, right? Fairly simple idea. Um, what would that be? That would be minus one, one, minus one, one. And then this would be one minus one because I, I win and you lose if we match our pennies, right? 
Uh, and again, this uh, goes back to what I was saying earlier that when each of these elements add or sum to zero, it's called a zero sum game for inevitably obvious reasons. Um, and specifically, this is a zero sum by matrix game because there's two matrices that define it, et cetera. And so what I'd, I'd like to do is I'd like to figure out what the behavior of replicates is gonna be on this particular game, right? So before I continue, what I wanna say about zero sum games is that they are purely competitive, right? The whole idea behind them is if I win, then you lose. And if you win, then I lose, right? There's no middle ground between that. Uh, between that. Right. So how are the agents going to behave? Right. I was, I was speaking to a friend about this and he asked, you know, what happens if I, if I just keep my action fixed at heads. Right. But if I keep my action fixed at heads and you realize that, then your best action is just to always play tails. And then you will continue to win and I will continue to lose. Right. And I, I will just end up completely worse off. And so that's not a very good solution for me. So I'm going to have to keep adapting to what you do and you're gonna to have to keep adapting to what I do. So what does the behavior look like? As you can imagine, it ends up with these cycles, right? That sit around this, this point in the middle at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And in fact, you can show that 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is uh, a fixed point for replicator, which corresponds to the Nash equilibrium for the game, right? Uh, I do that in the notes. I don't want to do that here because I don't think it's particularly important. But what's most interesting, I think, is the fact that you, this equilibrium is uh, what's called a, a center, which essentially says that if we start slightly off the equilibrium, we're never actually gonna converge down to it. We're just gonna keep cycling around it, right? And so again, this whole notion of this assumption that we can say over time, our agents are gonna play according to the Nash equilibrium is just completely false in this scenario because the only way you're ever gonna play according to Nash equilibrium is if you were doing so to begin with. And that's not a very reasonable assumption to make either computationally or in an economic situation, right? Um, in fact, we can take this idea of cycling slightly further uh, and show that this behavior is what's referred to in dynamical systems as a Hamiltonian system. Right, and as I said, I'm not going to go through you know a full introduction on what a Hamiltonian system is, but rather I'll, I'll give a quick intuitive idea. If we take the example of the uh, the sun and a planet orbiting it, right, we know that the behavior of said planet is to move in this ellipse around the sun, with the sun as as at one focus of the ellipse, right. And the reason why you, you know that is because you have this notion of energy conservation where the potential energy or the gravitational potential energy specifically um, of the, the planet plus its kinetic energy has to be conserved, right? And so the level sets or the contours of this total energy have to be exactly those contours on which the trajectories lie. So you can tell entirely where the trajectories are going, of the planet are gonna be just based on calculating the, the contours or the level sets of this total energy, right? And you can relate that back uh, to the matching pennies idea where instead of you know um, trajectories orbiting a sun, you have trajectories orbiting this equilibrium behavior. And you can show, and there's a full uh, proof of this in the notes, that this is a Hamiltonian system in the exact same way that the planet orbiting the sun was a Hamiltonian system, right? Uh, to take the analogy slightly further, maybe over-interpreting a little bit, uh, I like the way that one of my friends put it, where in this planet orbiting the sun system, the reason why you have this uh, trajectory is that the planet is kind of falling towards the sun, but it has to kind of overcompensate a little bit because it's it's got some tangential velocity, right? So the, what ends up happening is because of this overcorrection, the planet ends up um, falling, quote unquote, around the sun. And similarly, in the matching pennies game in, or in any zero sum game, the replicator, both agents are kind of overcompensating for the other, right? So 
I, I might start here and then you realize that you're losing out. So you're going to adjust your behavior and then eventually I'm losing out. And so I have to overcorrect for that uh, behavior. And then we're going to keep cycling around and doing, doing this whole process again and again and again. Right. Um, I think that's quite interesting from a, a structural perspective, just because you can actually assign quite a lot of structure to quite a simple game. And from that structure, you can say, we're never going to reach an equilibrium. And so we can't make this assumption. Okay. So, the so we've cycle, seen, sorry. The cycles you're talking about in the center, they bring the, the idea of attractor, but you're not using the word attractor. No, because um, these, these cycles aren't what you would call limit cycles, right? So a limit cycle is the idea that you will eventually converge down to a periodic orbit. But rather in this particular scenario, every initial point leads to a periodic orbit, right? You're not moving, you're not attracting to one, you're not moving away from one, you just stay on a particular level set. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, I should also mention that uh, in the Sun Planet example, I use this notion of um, total energy as a kinetic and potential energy. You might be wondering what the corollary is of energy in the context of learning in games. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the answer is there isn't one. Hamiltonian systems don't necessarily need to be corresponding to energy. That's just a particular example. Uh, it, in fact, it's just a, an invariant function that tells you what the behavior or, or where the trajectories of the system has to lie, right? In particular, for those of you who are interested in what that Hamiltonian looks like, it's uh, what's called the KL divergence between the, okay, let me just draw the trajectory. Uh, let's say that's one of the trajectories. It's the KL divergence between the a point on the trajectory and the equilibrium. The KL divergence is basically a measure of how far one probability vector is from another probability um, or probability distribution more specifically. And so uh, heuristically, you could think of this as if my, the distance of my probability vector to the equilibrium has to remain constant, then there's only one thing that I can do, right? I can only cycle around the, um, the equilibrium, at least in a, in a two-dimensional case. Right? And that's how you know that you're going to get these cyclic behaviors as opposed to uh, anything else. Right? Um, so we've seen cycles, we've seen equilibration. The last one that I want to show you is, is chaos. And for that, I want to go back to the rock, paper, scissors game, which is why I introduced it earlier. And particularly what I want to do is I want to look at a slight variant of it. So whereas before, and actually, finally, I can show you an example in which the payoffs aren't symmetric, right? So in the usual um, rock, paper, scissors game, you do have them being symmetric, right? Uh, that'll be minus one, that'll be one. And then similarly on the other side, right? Uh, minus one, one, minus one, right? But what I wanna do is I wanna introduce a slight variant in which the diagonals on A are going to be adjusted to 0 0.1. So you could think of this like, if we were placing bets on uh, winning and losing, if you know, if you win, then I owe you a pound, so I lose one. If you win, then you gain it. But then this slight variant is: if we draw, then I gain ten p, and you lose. Instead of ten p, I'm going to say that you lose five p, right? So hopefully, this kind of speaks to your question of: do the does the game need to be symmetric? The answer is no, because you can model the situation however you need it to be. Um, this is obviously a completely contrived example, but uh, depending on what situation you're looking for, you can design your, your payoff matrix around that. So anyway, so this is a slight variant of the, the rock, paper, scissors game, which before you, you remember was a zero sum game, right? But now we've kind of adjusted it so that it's nearly a zero sum game, but not quite, right? So what does the behavior look like for rock, paper, scissors when we have this slight variation? Well, on this particular slide, what I've done is I've plotted the behavior for player one, let's call that me, uh, as time evolves according to Replicator. And on the right, I've done the exact same thing. Sorry, I didn't know it would stop. 
Um, but what you can see is that this whole thing ends up filling out phase space. So your probability vectors will actually visit every single point, uh, at least on the interior of, of phase space uh, or probability space. And it will never actually settle down to an equilibrium. In fact, it will do this in a chaotic manner. And you can work out the necessary Lyapunov exponents to show that this is chaotic behavior, right? And, and mine is gonna do the exact same thing. So this is completely far removed from this notion of equilibration because well, we're, not only are we not going to settle down at any point, but we're actually gonna visit the entire phase space and never stop doing so. This orbit is, is, is dense in that sense, right? So that's um, the, the behavior of replicator on these particular games. I just wanna quickly stop to think about what we've, what we've just seen, right? We've looked at a couple of examples, the, the iterated prisoner's dilemma, matching pennies and rock, paper, scissors. What's interesting about that is these are quite simple games. I haven't even, like I, I have stuck to two players throughout this entire process and we've already seen the entire range of possible behaviors that we could get, right? So one could only imagine what happens when you throw in another player, right? Or as you were asking earlier, what happens when you start to think about a population of players? What kind of behaviors do you expect out of that? I'm, I'm sure you can imagine that this is gonna get quite complicated um, and quite, yeah, I guess complex would be not the most rigorous term, but it, it is very, very, a, a really rich variety of dynamics that we're gonna get. And that's the purpose of dynamics of games to answer this very question of what behaviors are we, can we expect from, uh, from adaptation? So to answer that, we've got you know, a few of these talks um, lined up where, okay, we've, we've looked a little bit at the replicated dynamic, which to be honest, um, firstly, it, from the dynamical perspective, it's the first one that was was analyzed. I, I think that's reasonable to say just because it has these links to evolutionary theory. Um, but also, I kind of think of it as the most fundamental of uh, of the learning algorithms that we're going to be looking at. the The next one, fictitious play, as I said, has quite a lot of applications in control, and it, that that can get quite uh, complicated as can Q learning, right? So we're going to see what kind of behaviors we can we can get if we slightly adjust our model for adaptation. Uh, the next point that I'd like to to push on is going back to your own question of what happens when you have a population of of agents, right? Um, specifically, I should I should replace this with the word network game because this uh, goes back to exactly your point of you know how do we deal with the fact that you know agents interact with one another on on some kind of social network or some kind of communication network how do we deal with the fact that you know you might prioritize information from one agent over another and as you said you would do that through introducing weights on a graph right but then there's fundamental questions of how does the topology of the network and how does the the weighting on the network actually affect these dynamics right and when you push to even higher populations you're coming into the realm of what's called mean field theory, which essentially allows you to, to model huge population systems, right? So those are the economic side or, or dynamical side of things. I also wanna to touch on a little bit the control theory aspect because I think you guys would find that quite interesting. Um, specifically, there's, there's two ends of the spectrum. One is distributed control, which effectively asks, how do I use game theory? If, if my robots interact uh, through a game, not necessarily robots, but any agents interact through a game, uh, how do I design the game to get the resulting beh behavior that I want? So this is kind of like game theory for control. And then you have this other end of the spectrum, which is equilibrium seeking, which is the idea that, okay, I've defined my game. Now I'd like for however my agents learn or adapt to reach an equilibrium or whatever behavior I want it to. So that's kind of looking at it from the other end of the spectrum saying, I want control for game theory, right? So both, both ends. And from there, um, we can kind of shift our attention a little bit 
And rather than thinking about our interactions through the lens of game theory, which is what we've been doing so far, we can look at other protocols for how agents interact. Uh, one of which is given by the idea of network science, I guess you would call it, or network theory, um, which as you can imagine has quite strong links with, with network games. And the other one, which is quite interesting from a mathematical perspective is the idea of swarms, which again, looks at really, really, really large populations. And that has quite strong links with, with mean field theory, right? So we can look at uh, any one of those things. And what I would hope, what I would ask from, from you guys as well, is if you could you know, give me a little bit of feedback on what areas you think might be quite interesting to look at. Um, I personally quite like the, the population adaptation problem, but that's my own bias. If, um, I, if you guys are interested in any other aspects, then please do let me know. Uh, you can either email Boomer or myself and, and we can adapt accordingly. And yes, that pun was intended. Um, and uh, of course, if there are any other aspects that you want to hear about, then please do let us know and we can, we can go from that. But with that said, that's this particular issue of replicator dynamic kind of out of the way. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, are there any questions at this point? I have a funny, funny comment here. Mm. If I'm, if I'm by nature, we're talking behaviors. Mm -hmm. So if I'm by nature, a very competitive, aggressive fellow, mm -hmm. but I learned game theory, and I learned that co collaboration or cooperation is rewarding. So maybe I'm kind of doing yin yang. I'm shifting between two different things that pull me in funny directions. And when you, you classify those behaviors as you as was the description, to what extent after learning them, I can find a way to deal with this more complex situation. So you're saying in some sense that your, your initial behavior would be to be quite stubborn and therefore not learn, but you notice the importance of collaboration and therefore you do decide to learn and you keep kind of shifting the goalpost between the two. Yeah. That's actually a really interesting problem. You know, I hadn't actually considered the, uh, the question of the agent's internal state changing over time. Um, wow. I, I mean, I know, I know you meant that as, as a comment, but that is actually a really, really interesting problem of, you know, how do you, I guess, impose some kind of time prisoner, variation. In the prisoner's yeah. dilemma, mm -hmm. I can imagine that a prisoner just got arrested is in some of emotional chaos and their rationality is in question, mm -hmm. okay? It's not uh, a cool, calm and collected prisoner here. He just got arrested, he got handcuffed. <laughs> So he's, yeah. <laughs> I make a film out of that. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it could be quite a good film. I mean, the, the agent themselves in that particular situation is really hot headed at that point and makes really irrational decisions. Whereas, you know, maybe when they were outside or before they were arrested, maybe they were making completely rational decisions. Yeah, it's actually a really. A glass of coffee and relax a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if anyone in, in the audience has seen the, the TV show Suits, but in that show, they actually do this, this very problem of they take the protagonist and, and another one of their, his colleagues um, into separate rooms and they both have to turn on, on one another and they're both given incentives to turn on one another. Um, and the whole thing actually plays out, you know, what's their emotional state throughout? How do they make this decision? How how close do they get to actually betraying one another in this really, really hot-headed situation? Um, it'd be quite interesting, actually, on your point to, to model that kind of behavior. 
and see how the effect of emotion affects your, your dynamics. Anyway, um, there's a question in the chat saying, I don't see any notes, where do I find them? Yeah, that's reasonable. Uh, so the I think Boom Dien sent out a really, really early draft version of the notes in one of the earlier emails that he sent, but I am updating it as we go along um, and I will send them to him to forward to everyone. Yeah, so, I, mean, I suggest, I suggest that you just maybe uh, create uh, your website on some Google website and then you can update. I think it would be nice. I mean, that to make. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, then, then, and then you yeah, can yeah. I think and, if if that's yeah. um, if that's an easier solution, then yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and then you can like, link, link probably to the YouTube videos, and so you have the YouTube hmm. videos and the and the lecture notes and the slides maybe, and then it would be it would hmm. be a nice series, I guess. Yeah. So on on the topic of the lecture notes, actually, I should mention that they go into a lot more of the technical uh, ideas. So things like. For example, earlier I mentioned the, the Nash equilibrium and I kind of just stated um, that A, it is a thing and B, that the, the game actually admits a Nash equilibrium. Now, that's, uh, that, that's obviously something that needs to be proven. And in fact, the reason why it's called the Nash equilibrium is because its namesake, John Nash is the one who proved it. So all of these things, things like, uh, does the Nash equilibrium exist? How do we, analyze it, et cetera. What does it tell us about um, uh, the game? And also how does how does the idea of the Nash equilibrium fit into the picture of dynamics? Uh, I can say now just that the, the Nash equilibrium is just one of the possible fixed points that a dynamic can um, achieve. But all of these sorts of ideas are in the, the notes, all the technical aspects are in the notes if you guys are interested in that area. Um, I should ask at this point um, if anyone is willing to to mention what their own interests out, out of the things that I've presented on this this final slide here. What would you be interested in in hearing about? I know there was someone who mentioned the the population problem as uh, an area of interest. So that's actually quite common. I hear that quite a lot. But if are there any? Other suggestions for what people might want to listen to or learn about. Equilibrium seeking would be quite interesting. Okay, yeah, I can I can do uh, a bit on what kind of conservation laws do you use in your Hamiltonian games? Okay, so in uh, the Hamiltonian system, so um, the zero sum game. Uh, let's have a look at where it was here, the matching pennies game. Okay, so in this particular example, as I mentioned, the um, KL divergence, uh, I don't know if you, you, you're familiar with the concept, but basically it's this measure of how far away one probability distribution is. In fact, if I, if I drew it out, let's say this is one probability distribution, we call this P. And this is another probability distribution, which is kind of overlapping my picture, calling, uh, call, I'll call it X, right? So the KL divergence basically says, you know, um, what is the overlap or, or how far apart is one distribution from another? And you can actually show that, so for, uh, um, for this particular example, X is, instead of being a distribution, it's all encoded inside this, this vector, right? This probability vector. So you look at the KL divergence or the distance from the equilibrium, let's call P the equilibrium, to any point X, T, right? And you do that for both agents, right? So you do that for, that's sum over K, right? And this would be K and this would be K, right? If you, if you sum all of that up, you find that this is actually conserved along the, the trajectory of play. Um, so it's quite an, it's quite an abstract um, concept, but it does tell you quite a lot about the behavior because it means you know exactly where the, um, where the trajectories are gonna lie. I should also mention on your point of conservation laws, uh, of course, like some Hamiltonian systems give rise to other invariant or conserved quantities. Um, so it's not necessarily always just one Hamiltonian that's conserved, you can actually get other ones. The question of what other quantities are conserved in um, collective adaptation is very much an, uh, an area of, 
open research? And I think it's actually quite a really important and quite an interesting question uh, because the most recent update to showing that replicator is Hamiltonian, the most recent one that I've seen is from 2021. This is really, really, really recent work, right? Um, and so the whole question of what other things are conserved, what does the Hamiltonian structure tell us about learning is an open question. And I, I genuinely hope that someone here also uh, finds that quite interesting and might wanna, wanna look into that problem. Um, so the other comments are that fictitious play network games and Q learning would be quite interesting. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, there's actually a lot of overlap between the um, algorithms themselves. In fact, if you want like a, 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 an overview of how they are related, I suggest that you would watch Sebastian's talk in which he, he mentions these points. Um, so the, the algorithms are themselves related. And so we can, we can talk about their relations as well. Um, and finally, there's a comment about continuous stochastic games, which, ooh, stoch well, stochastic dynamics in general, I don't know why I'm clicking there. Stochastic dynamics in general uh, come up a lot from the, the mean field theoretic perspective. Um, so you would model actually the population or the um, distribution function. So you, you would model the, the uh, state of the entire population through some kind of uh, distribution function and the idea of your stochastic differential equation is to say okay how, how does this move over time right I suppose it's more of a PDE model in that sense um, but yeah that's that's also something that we can talk about at some point uh, are there any other questions based on what we've done so far I'm going to take that as a no because I don't see anything else coming in. Yeah, there's another comment. Uh, oh, okay. So population adaptation. Yeah, actually, po population adaptation is is quite popular. Um, uh, most people that I've asked have, have said that as well. I mean, I, I obviously think it's quite interesting just from the sake of asking, you know, if this is what you have when you only have two players, or what happens if you throw in one more player into the problem? You know, does it does the whole thing blow up? Does it, does it, um, whole problem become incredibly difficult. And then once you get to much higher populations, you really have to constrain the problem because there's no other way that you can think about it. Um, so that's where mean field theory and that's where network games comes in because you have to enforce the fact that um, agents, that they need to only interact with a certain set of neighbors. Otherwise the whole problem becomes quite difficult. In fact, there was a, this study in 2018 that was published in Nature. Um, the, the paper itself is called The Prevalence of Chaotic Dynamics, um, which basically showed that if you take uh, just a normal game and you increase the number of players that are playing that game, any, any particular type of game, as once you start to increase the number of players, chaotic dynamics, like the sort of thing that we saw in the um, the rock, paper, scissors game become more prevalent. So the more players you add, it's intuitively true, but the more players you add, you actually get much more, more um, chaotic dynamics, which is really a problem from a design perspective. Um, if you know, you're trying to design a multi-agent system with 10 agents and now suddenly you're getting chaotic dynamics, that's not really ideal uh, from, from the design point of view. So yeah. Uh, w w that, all that to say that, yes, we will be looking at, at network games and I can focus a little bit more on those. You can call it tragedy of the masses. Tragedy of the masses, yeah, that, that does work actually, yeah. Um, you could also call it um, too many cooks on, on the broth, uh, I guess, the, the more sure. you add, the more, more irritating the situation gets. I'll be interested to see all these nine points, if mm. you could work a thread of commonality and differences between these nine points. Interesting, so how they relate to, to one another in some sense. Right, and to what extent one become more dominant or more irrelevant. Mm. To yeah, that's actually a good point. Problems. 
So like the particular application domains, I guess, uh, yeah, in which one a given, kind of... a given crisis or a given uh, uh, allocation trouble between populations or between, you know, in, yeah. So this tool, I can look at them as tools, as part of mm. tool, and which one is now more relevant or less. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question um, in terms of a comparative analysis as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually have a look into that and see if I can uh, I can put that in as well. Thank you for this suggestion. Sure. Sounds like that's everyone's yeah. comment. Yeah, thank you, Emma. It seems very, very, there isn't more questions. Yeah, if you have feedback, I mean, this is the, yeah, we are playing it by ear. So if you have any feedback mm. about, the, about this session, just uh, feel free to contact us, yeah. Yeah, in fact, also if, um, you know, there were certain aspects of this where you perhaps thought I was going too slow, maybe going a little bit too quickly and glossing over certain things, then please do let me know because um, that helps me, you know, adapt to, to what you guys want to hear about and, and how long you want me to spend on certain areas. And, yeah, and also regarding the next session, I mean, so somehow we are planning to to have uh, to have it every two weeks, and uh, maybe like Monday around this time. And so, uh, so yeah, so uh, so if you are okay with it, I mean, then the next session would be in two weeks at uh, twelve p.m. UK time. Um, so I'll, uh, yeah, so if it doesn't work for you, I mean, just let us know as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right then. Yeah, thank you, ML, for uh, for this nice. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks all for coming. Yeah, take care, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Great. Great. Thanks.